So hi, welcome to another episode of Net Support Radio. As you'll have seen uh, in this episode, we're going to be thinking about and trying to tackle uh, um, teacher recruitment in education. Uh, as you can see in the corner here, I'm Mark Anderson. I'm head of education at Net Support, and uh, I'm really excited to welcome onto the show today uh, John Richardson. John Richardson is a uh, former teacher and senior leader with over 12 years' experience uh, uh, working in primary and secondary schools. A really interesting. Uh, perspective there uh, where he's uh, taught both in secondary uh, as a science teacher and in primary as well and had uh, leadership roles uh, across those as well but I'm sure he'll share far more about himself what he's been doing and what's led him to uh, create um, teacher folio uh, during the course of the conversation so I'll stop talking for him and bring John uh, onto uh, the stage as it were hiya John how are you doing today Good afternoon. I'm good. Thank you, Mark. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to dig into this idea around teacher recruitment. Um, before we get into the questions I've got for you, could you share a little bit about your um, career in education? What led you to create Teacherfolio? Yeah, of course. Um, so, as you mentioned, I've got experience in both the primary and secondary sector in education. I, I started out in, in secondary schools around Liverpool, formed the area. And I was in the science department and uh, my career progressed and, and moved me into the primary sector. An, an opportunity popped up to go in as science coordinator. And, and from there, my, my role really evolved um, to being involved in, in being head of first school to assistant head teacher. And as part of those roles, I was involved in, in the recruitment process. Uh, so by that point, that stage in my career, I'd, I'd really experienced both sides of the recruitment process. You know, I'd been that NQT applying for my first role. Um, I'd been a more experienced teacher applying for a role in a school. And then I'd been on the other side of the process. I'd been that senior leader uh, looking to recruit a teacher who's, who's a good fit for, for my school. Um, and yeah, along the way, um, I encountered quite a few problems, a few struggles with recruitment. Uh, and myself and, and my co-founder, Liz Foreman, who I work quite closely with in, in my most recent post, she was deputy head. You know, we were both part of the same team looking to recruit a teacher. We were in a fortunate position where we had a good number of applicants applying for a role at the school. Uh, but we were really struggling to differentiate between the candidates applying. Um, and and yeah, we, we, we found a few problems. We, we spoke to other head teachers who were having similar problems. Um, and then we, we looked to put together and provide some solutions to these problems initially for ourselves um, and then began to provide solutions to, to other schools as well. Um, and since then, yeah, I've probably had about 150 conversations with head teachers all about recruitment, uh, learning lots about good practice that's in place in, in some schools, um, learning a lot about changes that, that happened throughout COVID and, and perhaps some changes for the better that, that schools are looking to keep hold of associated with the recruitment. So, um, so yeah, that's me and, and I'd love to share a few bits of this with you today. Great stuff. Thanks, John. It's interesting you mentioned COVID there, actually. Um, perhaps as a side sort of uh, trigger linked to the pandemic uh, and some of the sort of wider economic impacts, there's been an increase in initial teacher trainees um, how has the recruitment process changed over the last year? And are these changes likely to stay for 2022? Mm, yes, I found this really interesting, actually. I, I think I think it's tough for a couple of years we've, we've had, and it, obviously it's, it's ongoing. It's an ongoing situation. Um, COVID, it was definitely a catalyst for change in, in a few areas, even within education. Um, particularly in, in how we utilize technology to overcome certain problems that present themselves. And I think if we look at recruitment specifically, if we look at the recruitment process pre-COVID, over the last kind of 30 to 50 years, it, the, the whole process hasn't really changed all that much, you know, we still submit an application form and a cover letter. And, and maybe now we type it instead of handwriting it. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's not changed all that much. Um, and I think it was always going to take a real 
significant catalyst or something significant to happen um, in order to, to change the recruitment process that we have in place because it's been the same for so long. And when COVID hit, you know, schools had no choice but to, to respond. And it's not like there was a handbook there uh, to tell schools what to do. You know, if you need to recruit, but you need to have your school doors closed, you can't have any pupils in, you can't have any teachers in, uh, but you still need to recruit your teachers ready for September. There's not a handbook to refer to for what you do in that situation or a policy to refer to. Um, and I think, so to speak, that really swung the door open um, to more innovative solutions being implemented. And if we think about the recruitment process, ultimately, the aim of the recruitment process is to attract candidates, hopefully candidates that are a good fit for your school, um, and then get an insight into those candidates that allows you to establish which of those candidates are truly a good fit for your school. So ultimately, that's what the recruitment process wants to do. Um, and traditionally, pre-COVID, you know, there's a few real staples that, that most schools implement in order to achieve this. They've got their advert to attract the candidates. Um, they've got their application form and the cover letter to get an insight into their candidates. Um, some schools do a walk around because we need to remember, you know, the recruitment process is a two way process. Schools want to give candidates the opportunity to get an insight into the school culture to see if it's a good fit for them. Uh, but as we know, the walk around is also quite a nice sneaky way for, for school leaders to get an insight into the candidates and, you know, their first little glimpse of personalities to see if they're a good fit as well. Um, and then they get to the shortlisting, carry out lesson observations, interviews, sometimes a written task, um, and then references are collected. So they're the real staples of the recruitment, the standard recruitment process. Um, but obviously COVID hit and, and schools had to think, OK, we need to carry out our recruitment process. Which parts of our, our process can we still do and which parts can we not? And then we need to look at, well, what was the purpose of each step of our process? And how can we still achieve the same outcome by doing something else in its place? So they looked at the advert. Could they still advertise? Yeah. OK, advertisement not effective. We can still do that. That's fine. Can we still collect an application form and a cover letter? Yeah, we can still do that. Can we do the walk around? Well, no, our, we've not got any children in. We've not got any staff in. School doors are closed at this point. If we're looking back to around April 2020. But no, we can't do that. So they had to come up with a way of, they had to think, okay, well, what was the purpose of the walk around? It's an opportunity to give candidates an insight into the school. Um, it's an opportunity actually for us to get a bit of an insight into the personality of the candidates applying for a role at our school as well. So what can we do instead of the walk around? What can we do in its place? And, and we saw a few things happening here. Um, we started to see some school leaders to post, make use of video content, um, video content of themselves talking about the school, the school culture. And um, sometimes that would be posted within the job advert. Sometimes it'd just be a reference to it on the school website, our social media pages. So a massive increase in that. And um, some school leaders decided that they wanted to host video calls and almost do a virtual workaround or a virtual meet the head teacher. Again, delivering the same purpose, gives the candidates an insight into the school and insight into the head teachers, the culture that they're looking to implement in the school. Um, but also remember that two way process also so it's giving the head teacher that opportunity to meet the candidates and get that little insight into the personality at an early stage in the, in the recruitment process. And then they looked at the, the lesson observations. Can we do the lesson observations? Absolutely not. What can we do instead? Uh, well, some school leaders, they asked for candidates to submit a video of themselves role playing, perhaps the input to a lesson. Sometimes they would go on a live video call and, and again, role play a lesson. Um, I can only imagine how that must have felt when COVID had first hit, well before when we we're all used to doing video calls and jumping on to an, in front of an interview panel and role playing a lesson. It must have been really, really tough, uh, but needs must. And, and these are the things that we saw happening. Um, and then the interview, 
Well, in place of that, we had video interviews. We saw a lot of that happening. Um, sometimes there would be a written task. And in, in, the, in place of that, we, we saw some school leaders looking at collecting digital content from their candidates and often asking for a digital portfolio to be submitted. So the school leaders would sometimes, um, you know, set a few questions and ask the candidates to submit their responses. And sometimes even this would be in video format. We saw that happening more and more. Um, so the school leader might say, OK, give me a, a one minute video clip telling me why you think you're a good fit for the school. Uh, sometimes they might set a, 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 um, a task, you know, that, that revolves around the candidate marking a piece of work so they can get an insight into the kind of feedback that they would give to see if that's in line with the school expectations and so on. So we saw all kinds of things popping up here. So lots of more innovative approaches uh, that simply had to be, be implemented in order to carry out the recruitment process itself. Um, and what we saw, because COVID, it, as we know, it didn't just come and go very, very quickly. Um, you know, o during the, over the course of COVID, we saw these um, these innovative approaches really, really begin to evolve. Um, I think a lot of value was seen in empowering candidates beyond the written word to really express themselves. I think school leaders were, were noticing that they were actually getting a lot of insight into their candidates from this digital content that they were collecting, particularly with the video content that they were collecting from their candidates. And what we began to see was this kind of content being collected but much earlier in the recruitment process. Some even replaced the cover letter that they were asking from candidates with digital portfolios. So like I said, earlier in the recruitment process, they were, they were able to see, for example, a one minute video clip of a candidate saying why they're a good fit for the school in place of perhaps the candidate writing about why they think they're a good fit for the school. Sometimes they were actually seeing candidates teach before they carried out their shortlisting. And that, that was a really what we've, the feedback that we've had is that that's been really, really valuable. So instead of reading about what type of teacher the teacher is, they've been able to see them teach before they even shortlist. So it's bringing that insight to an earlier stage in the process. Um, and yeah, we've also seen that big shift in school leaders making use of digital content, even within their job adverts. So, you know, a lot more of head teachers talking to camera about the culture of the school, about the role that's being advertised in order to try to attract candidates that, that are a good fit for the school. Um, so, yeah, I'd say just, just to elaborate on that a little bit, one of, one of the best approaches that I've seen to a job advert it, it was pretty much, it was, it was really, I'd describe it as a glass door approach um, mm -hmm. where the head teacher spoke to camera about, about the school, about the role. And then there was a montage of teachers that had been recruited by the school, all talking about why they applied for the school and what their experience has been like while working at the school. And as a candidate looking to apply for a role, that gives you so much insight because you're seeing, you know, you're getting a real feel for the culture of the school. And ultimately, from the school's perspective, that's either going to really put off candidates who are not a good culture fit for, you, for the school, which is a good thing, by the way. Um, or it's, it's going to really attract some candidates and make them really interested if they see a culture that's, that's really well aligned with themselves. And sometimes there'll be jobs out there that are a great fit for some candidates, but the culture is not communicated. And um, and perhaps that could have an impact on, on the candidate attraction side of things. So that's something that, that yeah, I've been seeing more and more of. Um, and I think if, if you compare kind of everything that I've just briefly spoken about, um, the digital content on the job advertisement side uh, and the digital content being collected from candidates much earlier in the process and, and consider the level of insight that you can get from a candidate from that in comparison to just reading about what type of candidate they are. Um, you know, in the front end of the recruitment process, I think there's no comparison. Um, so do I think the changes are here to stay? A hundred percent. 
That's really interesting, John. Thank you. And, and I can see the benefit of it, you know, having applied for a few jobs in schools myself before. The things you're sharing there, things like, for example, about hearing from people in the school who've been working there for a while and getting their perspectives about what the school's like and that sort of thing. That goes to those conversations, those chance conversations you might have in the staff room or on your sort of tour around the school. And you can grab a quick moment with a teacher here and a teacher there. But how much better is it to better actually formalise that and actually share the good uh, uh, the good stuff that, t that, that the people who are already working in the organisation want to share about the place in which they work. I mean, and it's just a smart way. Uh, school leaders can get to control that message as well. Uh, and, and and again, sharing content and doing things digitally in that way makes it a, a really sort of more smart process, uh, I, I guess. One of the questions I wanted to ask you next was about how, how can schools ensure they're recruiting the best person for the job? But I mean, you, you, in your responses there, actually unpicking the key elements of the recruitment process um, and, and then thinking about how you can do those in a different way obviously forced into that situation because of the pandemic and the inability to undertake things in a more traditional uh, sort of sense but it gives you like you say that opportunity to do things slightly differently uh, and I, I would suggest like you are here actually John in, in a better way um, so with that in mind you know um Unpicking perhaps some of those th those strands you've shared there. Uh, if we've got any school leaders watching or school uh, people involved in school recruitment watching, uh, if any of those schools are looking to enhance their recruitment processes, have you got any suggestions maybe around things you've shared already uh, or some ec additional ideas uh, that, that could uh, help schools looking to enhance their recruitment process, John? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's key that if, if you're looking to enhance your recruitment process it's it's important that you have have a really clear have a really clear culture i think it comes down to that actually have a really clear culture and communicate that culture and be really specific in in what you're looking for and communicate that as well so the things i'm talking about there are very much front end of the recruitment process and actually before the recruitment process even begins they're the things that you need to have in place. You need to have a really clear culture. You need to be able to communicate that culture in order to attract the right candidates. And then I think that the most scope that there is to improve a recruitment process is very much in that front end and, and, and making sure that once you've attracted, you know, the right candidates and that all comes from the culture and communicating the culture in the school and communicating exactly what you're looking for once you've looked after that side you really want a solid strategy in place to make sure you can get the insight that you need into your candidates that's going to enable you to judge if they're a good fit for your school um and and make sure you're not going to have any really really well matched candidates just slipping through your net because you've not managed to get the level of insight to judge that they're a good fit for your school um and i think in order to do that you should absolutely consider um deploying some innovative strategies um and i think there's a number of ways of doing that and, and one way of doing that is to is to make use of that video content that, that we've mentioned um you know i mentioned earlier Myself and Liz, we've had about 150 conversations with head teachers. Um, talk, we've spoken about, you know, practice the problems that they've experienced, um, solutions that they've put in place. And what we've done at Teacherfolio is we've tried to bring all of that information together and we've fed all of that information into a recruitment tool that we offer to schools. Um, that allows school leaders to collect bespoke digital content from their candidates. Um, mm -hmm. So whatever they want to see, whatever it is that is going to give school leaders the insight into their candidates that they need in order to judge if they're a good fit for the school, they can request that using the digital, uh, sorry, using the teach folio recruitment tool. Um, and the way we've put it together, because that, that could, by the way, if you try to do that yourself and we spoke to a lot of school leaders during COVID who were attempting this kind of approach themselves and it, and it can get messy you can get video content coming through in all kinds of different formats you click on one video it plays fine you click on another and it doesn't play and and it can be tricky to really collate it so what the tool does 
is it allows you to request your content in a few clicks. It takes about five minutes. Um, it communicates with your candidates and gives them really clear instructions. It, it provides help videos to, to help them to provide the content that you're requesting. So it really, you, you know that your candidates are being really well looked after. And it presents these all of this content in digital portfolios within a dashboard that a school leader can log into on their deadline date. And all of the content is there waiting for them. And it's not just videos. Um, you know, we've, we've had some school leaders requesting examples of pupil work, for example, to show progress made when, when working uh, with, with teachers. Uh, we've had examples of photographs of classroom displays um, from NQTs. NQTs can even upload their you know, latest mentor feedback reports to give that kind of insight as well. And the tool also allows you to collect bespoke references. So you can ask the candidates, referees, whatever questions you want. And those are also attached to the digital portfolio. So from the school leader's point of view, once you've, like I say, you look after all of the things pre-recruitment process in, you know, being clear on what your culture is, being clear on what you're looking for, and that's going to help you to attract the candidates. And then what the teach folio recruitment tool allows you to do is get a real deep insight into those candidates to make sure you shortlist the few teachers that truly are the best fit for the school. Um, you know, and they're the ones that you would perhaps invite in for a lesson observation in an interview, but you can rest assured that you've not got any candidates just, just slipping through the net. So, so yeah, that's probably something that I'd, strongly recommend to school leaders that are looking to to enhance the recruitment process thanks john that's really interesting um just li linking through to that putting myself in position of somebody wanting to apply to a school what you know thinking about um teaching a job it's it's it's, it's not the easiest of jobs workload is a is, is a huge issue uh, uh um in, in education one which sees many teachers leaving the profession because of that uh, so if you think about TALIS, for example, which is a five-year international large-scale survey of teachers, uh, findings for England were 53% uh, so of primary teachers and 57% of lower secondary school teachers felt that their workload was unmanageable. And, and so with there being you know, teacher shortages uh, and uh, all of this, uh, and, and I, I've been you know, in, in the seat, in the interviewing seat rather than the interviewee seat as well, you know, um, while whilst you want someone who is is um, you know absolutely perfect for the role, sometimes you have to choose, choose if you, unless you want to put it out to, to out to uh, uh, um, uh, application process again. You know, you you, you have to sort of play the, the hands and the cards that you're dealt with. So, uh, with workload being a big issue, are you noticing any um, uh, practices or approaches from schools, um, head teachers, other leadership teams in how they sort of mitigate against any any sort of concerns or worries? that applicants might have about levels of workload within a school yeah definitely definitely mark um first of all those percentages that you mentioned i, I was definitely i'd count myself in those within those percentages um those figures of you know considering that the workload to be unmanageable um and and i know i've got a lot of teacher friends and i, I think a lot of them are, are within the, the statistic as well if we're being honest um it's an issue it's an issue that needs to be addressed and i think it's an issue that the schools are becoming more and more well they're aware of it anyway but i think we're, we're seeing i'm beginning to see a, a change in in the way that schools are trying to um perhaps communicate again it comes down to culture but uh, communicate the culture that they have in their school and um i think everybody every school leader would want you know a happy healthy motivated cohesive team that's what everyone's aiming for without a doubt um and i think to achieve that there has to be a sensible approach to workload um mm. and there has to be you know anything that's in place you it should be questioned we should be questioning okay why are we doing this and it, it might we've seen a bit of a shift in you know marking and feedback policies and, and that side of things um but everything should be questioned uh, every policy should be questioned you should be thinking well why are we doing this who is this benefiting and if, if you're struggling to answer beyond inspectors 
you know, in terms of who it's benefiting and who it's pleasing, um, then it needs to go on a change it needs to happen. Um, and I think in some schools, um, there can be uh, a mindset of, you know, well, we've always done it this way um, and, and they stick with it. And I think that can be quite dangerous. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe you have always done something a certain way, but and, and when you only had to do that thing, then that was manageable and that was OK. But now there's many, many other things on top of that um, due to pressures put on, you know, at government level and, and so on. So um, it's a tricky one for schools schools to to navigate but i would say yeah i'm seeing more sense more proactive uh, thought around workload more proactive thought around questioning processes that are in place to try to improve workload um and also uh probably the most successful school leaders that i've seen in attracting candidates despite the climate that we're in in terms of workload has been those school leaders that really, really invest in their staff who, who have a massive push on professional development, who provide opportunities for the staff, who have a culture of staff development and growth. Um, I think that for a candidate applying for a role is a really, really attractive prospect. Um, and then again, if you're looking at your recruitment process, if you have that in place, that's brilliant. That's amazing. Make sure you're communicating it and allowing yourself to, um, you know, kind of experience the benefits of having that culture, um, you know, which is you will attract candidates who also align themselves with that culture and buy into that culture and, and want to mm -hmm. develop themselves and improve as well. Some more great advice there, John. Thank you ever so much. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap the things up pretty soon. But look, if I'm if I'm a, an NQT or, or a, um, RQT or thinking about my next steps, um, I'm thinking about middle leadership perhaps, or I'm, I'm just a PGCE student uh, or uh, uh, someone on a, a, an ITT course thinking about applying uh, for my job. Um, have you got any tips for teachers who are thinking about um, you know, applying and then preparing for their job interview? What, what, what sort of tips would you share uh, about how to put yourself across in, in, in the best possible light to sort of show your best version of yourself on interview? Yeah, so first of all, Mark, I'd say, I'd say remember it's a two-way process. Uh, you know, be, before you even apply for the job, remember it's a two-way process and, and consider is is that school is that school a good fit for you is that role a good fit for you do you research you know hopefully that school have got a really insightful advert including video content and so on so you can get a feel for the school uh, a feel for the, the the culture that's implemented there um you know look on the school website look at recent reports consider what are the school's areas for developments do they kind of align with with something that you think you could add value to. Um, so yeah, I would say do that initial research. And, and beyond this, if, if you if you are lucky enough to get through to interview stage, my advice would be to do your, I call it the, the pre-interview prep. Um, so, so make sure you know what the school's strengths are, you know what the school's areas for development are, and you're clear in your mind how you think you could specifically address uh, some of the needs of the school. Um, and also, I suppose the ultimate question that you should be able to answer is not only they're not going to ask you, uh, why did you why do you want to be a teacher? They're going to want to know why do you want to be a teacher in our school? So I'd say have a really good response ready to answer that question. Be really clear in your own mind. Why do you want why do you want that specific role in that specific school? So that yeah, that'd be the advice that I give. 
Yeah, no, I think that's really good advice. The thing is, you know, that there are so many factors involved in it, aren't there? Um, and it can be quite an emotional process as well, can't it? You know, I, I know how disappointed I felt. You know, I remember applying for a, a leadership post once and um, I got down from, you know, from 10 down to the last two and I came second. You know, it, it can be really quite emotionally draining, can't it? Have you got any advice? I mean, I'm going off piece here a bit. Have you got any advice for people about how to respond when they don't get the post? Yeah, absolutely. Before we talk about the candidate side, on the school side as well, advice that I'd give is, you know, to, to make sure you tie off your loose ends, you know, be be aware and empathetic that, yes, you found your candidate, but you, you've got, pretend, you know, if you're shortlisted five, you've got four candidates there that, that might actually be really, really strong candidates and a really, really good fit for your school as well. Or if you're part of a multi-academy trust, they might be a really good fit for some other roles within your trust or you know at other schools who have similar cultures to your own school um so i'd say tie off your loose ends communicate be honest with the candidates and and, and do take the time to give that feedback because that can be really really helpful to the candidates um something that i've seen as well um is particularly within multi-academy trusts is, is them developing their own talent pools um, and inviting unsuccessful candidates to join their talent pool. So if a vacancy does pop up in the future, uh, you know they'll be they'll be there to be invited again to to apply for the post. Um, mm -hmm. If the schools are making use of things like digital portfolios, um, you know, teach folio has the ability for them to drop a candidate into a talent pool and the digital portfolio stays there waiting uh, for when another vacancy pops up or if a vacancy pops up in, a, in another school. So that can be really helpful, helpful for schools, but also helpful for candidates, particularly if they're getting that mm -hmm. feedback. And from the candidate's perspective, to answer your question, um, yeah, it can be tough. Uh, but what I would, the advice that I'd give is ask for feedback and um, don't take it to heart, listen to it, take it on board, write it down. Even if you, you know, emotionally, it can be tough, write it down or, or record, record the feedback that you get. If you're not ready to kind of act on it straight away, come back to it a little bit later when you, you kind of, you know, maybe in a better, a better mindset to, to listen to it and act on the feedback. Um, and yeah, if you are offered the opportunity to say, join a talent pool um, or be considered for a future, future, your post if it's right for you then then yeah take that opportunity but yeah I, I would say listen to the feedback take it on board uh don't be disheartened you know you, you never know what other candidates you are um up against within the process it could be an internal candidate who, who the school already knew really really well uh, it could be someone who's who's just got that more experience in, in the areas that the school's looking for um and you know, it, it might be that you're not a good fit for that school. And do you know what? The, there's, there's nothing worse than a square peg in a round hole. You don't want to be that square peg. It can it can affect, you know, you, your whole um, enjoyment of the, of the role that you're doing. Uh, and also the school might be looking to develop some a, a teacher that they bring in in a different direction to, to where you want to be developed. So just be patient and, and the right opportunity will, will come up. Thanks, John. Uh, yet again, more great advice. Uh, I need to wrap things up now. And uh, But uh, thank you so much for taking some, some time to share with us on Net Support Radio today about Teacher Folio. Uh, let's say I'm a head teacher. I'm thinking, you know, this, this John, he's got some he's got some really sound principles and, and ideas here. And I think it, it, this really resonates with me. Uh, where can people find out more about Teacher Folio so they can get involved, John? Yeah, so we've got a page on LinkedIn if you search Teacher Folio. Um, also, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find my co-founder, Liz, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can drop me an email, john at teacherfolio.com. Of course, we've got our website, teacherfolio.com, if you want some more information as well. And if you do get in touch, look, I'd always be happy to jump on a call. Um, and, and the first thing I would always do is, is talk to you about what you've already got in place. And if I can give any advice on, on how you can improve what you've already got in place, then I will. Um, and, and we could look at, how teacher folio could potentially enhance what you already have in place and, and to be clear it's it's a tool that can fit within the process that you already have up and running um so if you're thinking oh i've got a subscription with such and such a body 
uh, that doesn't end for another two years. Um, you know, you don't need to wait two years. We offer a, a, a relatively really low cost uh, solution that, that could really enhance your process and, and help to make sure you're recruiting the teachers that are best fit for your school. Um, so, yeah, don't hesitate to drop me an email. I'd always be happy to jump on a call. Awesome stuff. Well, listen, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. And I look forward to seeing you in the very near future. Thanks so much, John. Thanks. Absolute pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Cheers.